Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm not an applied physicist, you know, I'm a, a chemist from day one until now, so don't be afraid, don't be insulted if you're a physicist. Um, I'll tell you about um, one aspect of our work uh, on carbon dots. Uh, as you see, these are, in my opinion, very interesting system, very interesting nanomaterials uh, with uh, properties that can be applied from biology to materials to sensors, also in physics. So I'll tell you some of our work. We've been doing many things with carbon dots. I'll tell you about uh, some aspects of our studies. Okay, so uh, I'll start with uh, talking a little bit about the structural and optical properties of carbon dots. As you see here, already the, the optics, the color is very prominent aspect of a uh, carbon dot research. Then uh, I'll tell you about some applications. One application will be kind of biologically oriented. I understood that this is a materials institute, so I, I didn't put much on biology. And then I'll uh, tell you about some sensing application. I'm talking about only one representative sensing applications, but since its early work, carbon dots have been used extensively as sensors. And then I'll tell you about a three different, very different directions that we pursued very recently in my lab uh, using carbon dots uh, as for self-healing fluorescent gels, for mechanical sensors, and, as, and in water remediation. Okay, so let's start. Um, carbon dots, uh, in the literature you'll see that carbon dots are called also carbon quantum dots or graphene quantum dots. And the quantum here is, is really because of the small size. So carbon dots are usually in the range between 2 and 10 nanometers. And essentially they're made of little uh, uh, nanoparticles of graphene. So you see here, these are the graphene sheets or graphite sheets. It's a matter of definition. And uh, this is the core of the carbon dots, but that's actually not what makes carbon dots interesting. What makes them interesting, as many nan nanoparticles are, is the surface properties. And um, this actually describes a, one of the most attractive and interesting things about carbon dots. Because people made carbon dots for like maybe 15 years, and then suddenly after making them, usually they, initially they made them uh, just a, using a gas pyrolysis or sputtering. And when they succeeded to purify carbon dots, they found that they have really beautiful colors. These are not just colors, these are fluorescent colors. And what's interesting is that carbon dots do not have single colors, but a variety of colors from blue to red, depending on the excitation wavelength. Here you can see the spectra. Each spectrum here, this is a different fluorescent emission spectrum, depending on the application, uh, on the excitation. So if you excite, let's say, 325 nanometer, you get a peaks, a, a, an emission peak at 450, a blue peak. If you excite at 450 nanometer, you get emission at 530, 550, more to the red. So these uh, multitude of colors were really one of the defining points of carbon dots. Just something about the synthesis. Uh, the reason carbon dot papers have exploded in recent years, it's really exponential growth in paper, in publications, is because it's extremely simple to make carbon dots. All that you need is a carbon source. And if you look around you, everything is really a carbon source. You can take wax, you can take juice, you can take fruit, you can take garbanzo beans, honey, these are kind of things that you eat, but you can take polymers, 
you can take proteins, you can take wood. And all what you need to do, you need to heat it, and not very aggressively. You just heat it to 100 and 200 degrees, you wait a few hours, you purify, and then you get carbon dots. It's as easy as that. Actually now, if you look at the literature, you can see papers about finding carbon dots in beer, finding carbon dots in popcorn, finding po carbon dots in lasagna, whatever. So, you know, on one hand it can be very scary, but we're alive and well, so we probably in this very moment eat and breathe carbon dots, but they're not bad for you. And that's actually another very important advantage of carbon dots. Because you use all these natural carbon sources, carbon dots are generally biocompatible, they're not toxic, so as a therapeutic application they're very useful. So, if you want to give your students to, give, to make carbon dots, you can just go ahead, go to the lab, and in one week you can have tons of carbon dots. Now, let me talk a little bit about the different colors, because this is really one of the most important physical chemical properties of carbon dots. So you see different colors. Now, there's well-known nanoparticles, the early days of nanoparticles, the semiconductor quantum dots. These are very well-known nanoparticles. They also have different colors. But the different colors of semiconductor quantum dots or inorganic quantum dots are very well defined. The different colors are because of the size of the quantum dot, which essentially gives different um, excitation uh, when you squeeze and you get the quantum effect. So if you create a big semiconductor quantum dot, you would expect that the color is narrow, very defined, be a red color. If you use a smaller nanoparticle, a smaller diameter, you get a blue nanoparticle. So it's a very close and clear link between size and color. It can be explained physically, and it makes semiconductor quantum dots very, very useful in uh, various uh, applications. Now, in carbon dots, it is different. The main, one of the main differences is that actually when you look at the emission spectra, they're much broader than the corresponding spectra of semiconductor quantum dots. So that tells you that the size is not really the main thing here, because you can make quant carbon dots that would have very well-defined sizes. So the reason of the colors is actually different. And the common belief right now, the hypothesis right now is that the color of the carbon dots come from the surface of the carbon dots. Essentially, people call them surface states or surface defects. So, if you see that there are certain states, certain uh, levels on the surface, energy levels on the surface, and if you excite electrons, then the electrons will just go down depending on the surface state, emitting different colors. So if you have a uh, high energy, you get blue. If you have medium, you get green, low energy, yellow, etc. This is actually a very important distinction. Because when you talk about surface properties, it opens a lot of opportunities. Because you can, because you can manipulate the surface using chemistry, and by doing that, you can change the color. And this is a very important point about carbon dots. Because the chemistry of carbon is very well developed. It's relatively easy to take carbon carbon materials, carbon dots for that matter, and change the surface, either through reactions or through physical means. So if you do that, you can also change the physical uh, properties of the carbon dots and the optical properties of the carbon dots. Another very important thing is that by changing the surface properties of carbon dots, you can also achieve molecular targeting. 
because you can put different functional groups of the carbon dots and then you can take them to various targets, various locations in the body, in polymers, in chemical systems. So how can we control carbon dot surface? As I told you, one of the main thing is by surface functionalization of carbon dots. You make carbon dots and then you manipulate the surface. And this is okay because as I told you, carbon chemistry is well developed. But there is actually an easier way which is very unique for carbon dots. This is what we call the structural memory of the carbonaceous precursor. Now remember, when we make carbon dots, we don't use very high temperature. We use only 100 degrees, 200 degrees. These are considered relatively low temperature. And when you use such low temperature in your synthesis, you do not break completely the molecules that you use for the synthesis. So you just, you don't pyrolyze them completely, you break them partly, and on the surface of the carbon dots, you can still have the functional residues of your starting material. So by doing that, you can still select the starting material, the building blocks, and use their functional properties for a carbon dots. Let me just show you an early example in my lab in which we use this structural memory concept. And in this case, we actually used a very simple molecule called folic acid to make carbon dots. Now, why did we use folic acid? Folic acid is a very well-known biological molecule. This will be the very limited biological part of my, re of my lecture here, but it's important. So folic acid is a simple biological molecule. It's very important because it's a molecule that involves in cell metabolism. It's a molecule that cells use to induce metabolism. So actually pregnant women take folic acid because they need to get their cells to, uh, to metabolize fast uh, for the, the fetus in the body. Cancer cells also like folic acid very much because cancer cells like to metabolize very quickly okay? because they need to reproduce and need to divide. So how does it happen? On each cell there is a receptor called the folate receptor. The folate receptor takes or recognizes the folic acid and then cell metabolism occurs. So you might imagine that cancer cells one of the, the uh, important things about cancer cells is that they overexpress the folate receptor on the surface. So I, our hypothesis in this uh, project was, let's take folic acid, we make carbon dots. Now, the carbon dots will still have the structural memory of the folic acid on the surface. So these carbon dots will recognize the folate receptor on the cell surface and we're just going to use these carbon dots for selective labeling of cancer cells. That was the idea and th that worked. Obviously that's why I'm telling you about this. And here what you see is specific cancer cell labeling using these folic acid carbon dots. So these Two types of cells, these are very well-known cells for, for biologists. These are cancer cells. These are cell lines, cancer cell lines, overexpressing the folate receptor. So you see when we incubate them with the carbon dots, you see very strong fluorescence from the carbon dots because there's a lot of carbon dots attaching to the cells. These cell lines have only medium expression of the folate receptor, so you see less staining. And these cells, also well-known cells, these cells are conventional cells, not cancer cells. They have very little expression of the folate receptor and you see that there is less, much, much less 
labeling of the cell. So this experiment tells you that indeed there is something about carbon dots that retain the memory of the functional groups that you use for making the carbon dots. Okay, we, just, we publish it on the cover of this journal. So this concept of carbon dots that you can manipulate the surface can be taken to many different directions. Here I'll show you another very uh, brief uh, example of a biological application in which we take carbon dots and we attach to the surface two ethyl chains. Actually not two, we're not sure how, exactly how many, but probably one, between one and three because they're very small. And why we did that? We attached these acyl chains because we wanted the carbon dots to go specifically to membranes. If you look at biological membrane, the biological membranes also have these acyl chains on the lipid. So our hypothesis was these carbon dots are going to recognize these biological membranes and then incorporate in the membrane and we could use them for staining, for labeling membranes. Okay, so this was the experiment. We took the carbon dots with the acid chains attached to the surface. Then we mixed them with vesicles. These are giant vesicles. They're called giant because they are micrometer size, so you can look them, you can see them under a microscope. These vesicles just mimic cells. So you have these membranes, you have the inside, and you have the outside. And when we did that, we got these beautiful pictures. These are a, a bright field, a microscopy image of these vesicles. You see, this is five micron here, so they're quite big. And then, if you look under a fluorescent confocal microscope, you can see these beautiful colors of the carbon dots that just went into the membrane, into the bilayer. And here again, you can see the different colors of the carbon dots from blue, green, yellow, red, all the entire spectrum, depending on your excitation wavelength. This also we publish in, the, in, this, in this journal if you want to look. What else we can do with these particular vesicles? We can, do, we can use these vesicles for cell labeling. The reason we can do that is because when we have liposomes, and the liposomes find, recognize cells, they fuse with the cells. This is actually a common mechanism for drug delivery. So if we have these fusion, experiment, fusion phenomena, you can think that the carbon dots that are staying in these membranes of the vesicles, they will fuse with the cell membrane and get transferred to the cell membrane and then used for labeling. And that's exactly what we did. These are cells, live cells. Remember I told you that the carbon dots are very good for cells. They're not toxic. So you can see here images of cells and the different colors. And what you see is uh, just that the membrane of the cell is labeled with the carbon dots. Okay, so this is about biology. Let's go to materials. Now, one thing about materials is that, as we know, many materials are not solution. They're not in, in, in water, just like cells or vesicles. They're solid. And solid materials give us big problems when we use fluorescent materials. And this is because of the well-known phenomena called fluorescence quenching. When you have two fluorophores, two fluor fluorescent particle or molecule or whatever, when they're immobilized and they close to each other, the excitation energy that you give them very quickly dissipates into the solid material and then it's not emitted as light. So you lose all the beautiful colors and the optics. This is not only in carbon dots, but this is a big problem if you want to take carbon dots and use them in solid materials. So the main problem is, one of the main problems, 
is the distance between the nanoparticles, the distance between the carbon dots. If the distance is too small, you're going to have dissipation of energy, no fluorescence. But fortunately, there are ways to overcome this problem, to overcome this barrier. And what you need to do, you need to immobilize the carbon dots and make certain distance between them so they will not be close to each other, so they're not going to be a way for the energy, the excitation energy, to dissipate and get lost. So one way to do that, uh, I'm going to show you one example, actually a couple of examples, is to put carbon dots in porous host materials. So these are materials that are solid, solid matrices, that can host the carbon dots and keep them in certain distances. And if you do that, then you're in good shape. Then you can have the carbon dots in this material, you can have excitation energy, and you're going to have light emission. So this is the first example. The first example is putting carbon dots inside aerogels. In this particular example, we used aerogel for sensing lanthanide. Why do you want to sense lanthanide? Lanthanides are often associated with radioactive materials. So lanthanide sensors are important if you, for example, want to monitor radioactive waste or radioactive accidents. So you need sensors that will detect lanthanide compound in very good selectivity and uh, reliability. Little bit about aerogel. Aerogel is, as you know, as you hear, air. It has lots of air. It's actually the most porous material that exists. It's a silica framework that has lots of empty space inside. We like aerogel in this application because it's also transparent. And of course, if you want to use optics, if you want to use color, you want to select materials that will be transparent. So, in this experiment, what we did, we prepared carbon dots from this small molecule called a 2 thanoyl fluoroacetone, TTA. Okay, TTA in short, much better. This is a small molecule, but it's actually quite unique because it recognizes certain lanthanized and actinides. And remember what I told you about the structural memory. So we made these carbon dots from this molecule in order that the carbon dots that we make will recognize, will bind to lanthanide and actinides and be the platform for sensing these ions, these compounds. So that was the goal, specific detection of lanthanide and actinide. The chemistry was very simple. You take the aerogel, Okay, you make aerogel uh, before the experiment. You take this molecule, the TTA, again, very mild reaction conditions. Just in water, low temperature, relatively speaking, six hours, and you end up with carbon dots inside the pores of the aerogel. Okay? And hopefully, these carbon dots are still going to have these structural units from the TTA, so we can recognize lanthanide. And these are some of the sensing experiments that we did. These are actually confocal microscopy images. We did also, as you're going to see, I think you're going to see a visual detection of the lanthanide. Here, these are the, the starting material. You see, these are the uh, fragment, actually, of the aerogel. Under microscope, they're very fluorescent. Now what we do here, if we add this ion, samarium, samarium is a, a, a lanthanide a ion, and what happens here is that when you add samarium, you have fluorescence quenching. So the binding of the samarium ions to the carbon dot surface causes quenching. This is actually what we see with different uh, lanthanide ions. 
the red one is uranium, with uranium we see some shift, with europium and samarium we see intensity decrease. So this is actually two different mechanisms of sensing. Color change, fluorescent shift, and fluores little bit fluorescence quenching. Now, these are the TTA C dot aerogel. Here we use different ar car carbon dots. In this experiment, we use just carbon dots from glucose. These carbon dots do not have the recognition element, the TTA recognition element on the surface. And indeed, what you see here, that there's no response, there's no change. There's no change, not in the shift, the fluorescent shift, and not fluorescent intensity, because the glucose carbon dots do not interact, do not bind with the lanthanide. So these are just the overall uh, data here. You see, if we look at the wavelength shift, you can see very clear selectivity to uranium. This is uranium oxide, a very common compound of uranium. So as you increase the concentration of uranium, you see a very big shift, up to 40 nanometer. This is very significant fluorescent shift. This is the fluorescent intensity. So if you look at the fluorescent intensity, you see selectivity towards samarium. So as you increase the concentration of samarium, this actually is quite a low concentration. Say sub-PPM range, it's quite good sensitivity. So again, with samarium, you see, oh, sorry. With samarium, you see very relatively strong quenching of the fluorescent signal. Okay, so let's move on. We left biology, we're going to leave sensing, okay? And we're going, to use, we're going to use carbon dots for a totally different story. This story here involves very interesting materials called self-healing gels, okay? And in this particular project, we made fluorescent self-healing gels from carbon dots and the, this polymer polyethylene imine. Now what are self-healing gels or self-healing polymers? Now if you put self-healing in Google, you'll find this. Self-healing with Reiki. This is very exciting, you know, maybe it's a, more lively than chemistry. <laughs> and maybe not, but this is not self-healing gels, okay? Self-healing gels or self-healing materials are very interesting materials. And the reason why they're interesting, interesting is that because as the name implies, they self-heal. So these are actually very uh, good materials these days because they can extend the life of plastics. You know, plastics, I can talk about it for hours, but plastic is one of the devils of the modern world, you know, everywhere. If you use plastic that they can heal themselves, you can reuse them again and again, that's going to help the environment. And the reason these plastic, these self-healing materials can be reused is because of the chemistry. If you create polymers or gels that can open bonds and make bonds very easily, you can have self-healing materials. So these are just some examples of, of, of the self-healing um, book, self-healing um, series. They're getting very popular. It's also very recent material. And we also make uh, self-healing gels here. The self-healing gels that we made were based on carbon dots. Surprise. Carbon dots, uh, we can make carbon dots, as I told you, with different surface groups. In this case, we made carbon dots with these functional units. It's called aldehyde. Now, we made different carbon dots with different colors. Blue carbon dots with aldehyde. Gr uh, no, green carbon dots with aldehyde. Blue, yellow, all with aldehyde. The reason we want them to have aldehydes on their surface is because we wanted to make a very special chemical bond called imine bond. These are the imine bonds. You have imine bonds when you react aldehydes with amine units. Very simple. Now, what's important about imine bonds 
is that they are relatively weak bonds. They're not covalent bonds that are very, very strong. It's very hard to break them. They're not van der Waals bonds, which is very easy to just break with very low energy. E-mine bonds are somewhere in the middle. They're called labile bonds. And because they're somewhere in the middle, you can break them at room temperature. And you can also remake them in room temperature. So if you have these this network, this material, you're going to have self-healing properties. And this is what you get. This is the initial material, the carbon dots, the polyethylene imine network, and these are the imine bonds. If you cut them with a knife, okay, you break the imine bonds, here it is, but then if you put them together, the two pieces, you wait a couple of hours, Sometimes you can add some solvent, it's, it's not necessary, but you wait, you'll see that they're going to come back together and heal. So these are self-healing polymer. These are just some physical chemical properties of, of, of this polymer. Here, this is a kind of well-known rheology experiment where you here you make the cut. So uh, um, you see the, uh, the black um, parameter here. And then you wait, and then it goes back, then you can cut again, it goes back, cut again. Basically, uh, this is a physical experiment to prove that there is indeed a self-healing. Again, some nice pictures. You see the polymer, you cut it to pieces, and then you heal it back. You can see still the edges here of the, of the crack. Very important, note here that this is under UV, so this is a fluorescence image. So this self-healing gel is fluorescent, which is one of the first, maybe the first or the second fluorescent self-healing gels that were reported. This is another a nice example of, of, of these self-healing properties. You can just push it with a um, pencil or something. You can make this uh, dip here, and then after a few minutes, it goes back to the original. And the nice thing about fluorescent self-healing gel is that you can create gels with different colors. This is just an example. Here we took two different gels with different carbon dots. This is the blue carbon dots. This is green yellow carbon dots. And you can see that after they heal together, you can really get a gel with two colors, just from the self-healing properties. Now we did another thing with this uh, self-healing gels, again, based on the different carbon dots, the different colors. Here we can uh, irradiate the gels with blue lead, very intense blue light. By doing that, you can emit, you can take the gels and emit light, make them into a sort of light emitting diodes. And what you can see here, these are the spectra and these are the images, the, the uh, photographs of different gels with different carbon dots. You can see yellow, light emitting uh, film, green, this is kind of bluish. This is actually a, a mixture of couple of two carbon dots that give you white light, which is actually a very challenging thing to do. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it in another application. Okay, so we talked about um, interesting material. Let's go back to a uh, sensing, but not your common type of sensing, but in this case, we would like to use carbon dots for mechanical sensing, okay? Now, why it's important to do mechanical sensing at all? Okay, so there's various materials usually polymers and plastic that are elastic and the elasticity is actually one of their defining properties so in many cases you want to evaluate you want to measure how elastic they are okay you can do it by stretching okay and then you measure the stretching using some kind of a mechanical sensor a mechanical stretch sensor you can apply pressure Applying pressure, you also would like to find out how much pressure you put 
on these materials, on this elastic polymer. You can bend, okay, certain polymers you can bend, and again, you want to find out how much bending you apply and if the polymer can withstand the bending. So uh, in this experiment, in this uh, application, we use stretchable polymers. Okay, there's various stretchable polymers. It's not so easy to create stretchable polymers because in many cases, if you take a polymer and you stretch it, it just simply breaks. So there are certain polymers called elastomers that are stretchable. They're usually divided between thermoplastic elastomers and thermoset elastomers. The difference is that in the thermoplastic, you see that the chains, the two polymer chains, are not connected to each other. So in these polymers, it will be more difficult to go back to the initial step. In this case, they, they, the chains of the polymers are connected to each other, so <coughs> it will be uh, easier to go back. So in both polymers, when you apply a stress, when you uh, pull it, you can have an elastic deformation. Um, so these are two types of, uh, of, of polymers called elastic uh, elastomers. Now for our application, we also like these elastomers because this chain network gives space between the chains. Why do we like space? Because we want to put our carbon dots. Okay? And we want to put our carbon dots in order for them not to aggregate, to, be, to have enough space between each other so they're not going to be fluorescence quenching. Okay? So this is a, a polymer we selected, it's a common polymer, it's called polyvinyl butyral, PVB. It has a long chain structure, these are the chain, and be, between the chains of PVB there is sufficient space and there is a possibility to have guest materials, guest particles, just like our carbon dots, just like what we need. So PVB, in terms of mechanical properties, is a stretchable polymer, okay? You can stretch it, it goes back in certain condition, and also it is transparent. And again, if you want to use optical properties like our carbon dots, you want your material to be transparent. So what did we do? We took two starting materials, two mo simple molecules, and we made carbon dots. One of them gave green carbon dots, the other one gave red carbon dots. Now, why do we select these starting materials? It's because we wanted to have carbon dots with these hydroxide and amine units on the surface. And the reason why we wanted these molecules is because we want to incorporate the carbon dots within this PVB polymer through hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding between the amine and the hydroxyl compound, hydroxyl units of the polymer. Okay, also in this case we have a hydroxyl that makes a hydrogen bonding with the polymer chains. So we made this polymer, we made this composite polymer, and what is the hypothesis that we checked in this experiment. Now it was the following. Initially, before stretching, we're going to have this polymer network with the carbon dots inside. Now because the polymer is not stretched, there is relatively speaking close distances between the carbon dots, among the carbon dots. If we have small distances among the carbon dots, they're going to be relative high quenching we're going to have low fluorescent signal from the carbon dots. However, what will happen if we stretch the polymer? If we stretch the polymer, we have the same number of carbon dots inside, but now there's more volume, there's more distance, so the average distance between the carbon dots will change. If you change the average distance, you have much higher fluorescent emission because they're going to be less fluorescent quenching. Now there's going to be another thing. If you change the distance between the carbon dots, they will see different 
environment around them. So we expect also that the color will change a little bit. So we expect both to see a shift of color and change of emission. Now let's see how it works. We call it stretch dependent fluorescence or fluorescence that depend upon mechanical forces. Okay, so these are real pictures, okay, real photographs of this polymer. This is with the red carbon dots, so here no stretch. But then we start stretching, 30% increase, you see that the color increases, and then it is in more intense and much more intense. So you see that's the red color that's in low intensity. Here you see very strong emission. And also you see that it's much more orange than, the, than here. So we have both increase of intensity and shift of color. Okay, you can see it actually very clearly in the emission spectra, the increase in fluorescent and the little bit of fluorescent shift. You can get the same thing also with the green carbon dots on the green fluorescent. So these are the uh, polymer films without stretching, you start 30%, 135%, 200%, 265%, okay, from this initial side, and you can see again very clearly that the intensity of the color increases significantly. Now, the question is whether you can use this to actually quantify the mechanical deformation. And the answer is yes. These are a conventional stress strain curves that you uh, apply in any uh, type of polymer. And this bold line, this is what you expect uh, or you calculate actually when you, cal you, com you uh, measure the strain and the stress of the polymer. And you can see that the, the points, the experiment, experimental points, both for the green poly carbon dots and the red carbon dots are very close to the theoretical curve. And this is actually a, a, one of the nice things about this work is that really you can uh, correlate the fluorescent intensity of these polymer films with stress. Okay? So this thing with the green carbon dots is a red carbon dot. These are really a calibration curve of the mechanical stress. So in this experiment we actually proved that you can use these the fluorescent the carbon dots to monitor mechanical stress. And actually we did another nice thing about this with this system, um, again related to optics. Now just to show you the RGB color space, you know you have in all our uh, optical instruments, old TV etc, when you take green, red, and blue, these are the main colors. You can get all colors that you want, particularly white color. Actually, the white color is the mixture of these three different colors. So our idea in this experiment was, let's take a mixture of carbon dots and put it in this PVB stretchable polymer. Now, if we used a certain mixture, we found an 8 to 2 mixture between blue carbon dots and red carbon dots, and we irradiate it with a blue light, 410 nanometer, we get white light. Okay? This is according to this RGB color space. So, this is actually not perfect white. This is the film with this mixture, but this actually looked quite nice. And if you uh, use the CIE map, this is just a map that can give you a, exactly what color do you have. You see the mixed color is exactly in the middle, which tells you that this is quite a good quality white light. Now, we did that not just to make white light, but what we wanted to do here was to show that through stretching of the film, you can control the intensity of the white light. And this you can see very nicely here. Again, if you stretch the film, the distance between the carbon dots gets bigger and you get more intense light, more intense fluorescence. 
These are the colors, you see, without stretching, with stretching, very strong white light. Here you can see the spectrum. Here, this component between a 450 and 700, these are the visible spectrum. And you can see after stretching, very strong um, white light. So if you want to look at this paper, uh, we just uh, published it about two months ago. Okay, so something totally different to finish with. No colors, no sensing, but very environmental. Okay, and in this case, we created a system called carbon.hydrogel and we used it for water purification. Now, don't need to tell you that water purification is extremely important in these days, both because of water scarcity in many parts of the world, water pollution, you need to find ways to get clean water. Uh, there's various techniques um, that people use for water purification, is thermal treatment, ion exchange, reverse osmosis, and if these, in, these uh, pictures look very complex to you and very complicated, that's true, they're very complicated, okay? But so basically what we want is something very simple, okay? If you can create a simple system that will take water, let's say, from the ocean, and use energy from the sun to get fresh water, bingo. This is very important, okay? But obviously it's not so easy. But let me tell you what we did, okay? We developed a very simple system that can do exactly that. What we did, we took two biodegradable, actually, polymer, um, CMC and chitosan, okay? These are a polymer, biological, or actually, a, these are not, yeah, they are biological polymer taken from uh, plants, okay? And the good thing about these two polymers is that if you mix them together, they form what's called a hydrogel. It's a porous matrix that can absorb lots of water. And this matrix can also have space for carbon dots, our good old carbon dots. So we created this mixed system, CMC, Kytos, and the framework, and carbon dots sitting inside. And the idea is, irradiate it from the sun, give this simple sunlight, no heat, just sunlight. These materials will evaporate the water and you get clean water. Now, it looks very nice and simple, but why it happens? Now, in this experiment, in this system, actually, we need to remember that carbon dots are not only light emitters. And you irradiate carbon dots, they take up the energy. Now, to release the energy, they can do one of two things. They can release the energy through luminescence, fluorescent properties. This is what I showed you in this 45 minutes. This light emission by carbon dots. And remember, we were working very hard to get this light emission, to prevent quenching, to separate them. This was hard work. But there's actually another mechanism that in this application we want very much. This is heat emission. And this is actually dominant in solid phase. Now, if the carbon dots are close to each other, maybe they immobilized, they will not release energy as light, but they will release energy as heat. And this is actually the main thing in this application. Because what we want? We want this system to be irradiated with light. We want this system to absorb light and release it as heat. Now, if it releases this energy as heat, water that gets absorbed in this hydrogel, the temperature will go up and it will evaporate. If the water will evaporate, will you collect the evaporated water and we got purified water, okay? So in this system, the carbon dots have crucial role to take heat, light, transform it into heat. 
Now, there's various materials can, that can do that. But most of the materials that can do that are either very hard to make, like semiconductor nanoparticles. But carbon dots, extremely easy to make, not toxic, can be recycled, and very easy to produce. So this is the, the carbon dot that we, we use. These are made from a, a very simple molecular uh, molecule called phenylendiamine. Heating at 180 degrees, you get carbon dots. You can get kilograms of these carbon dots in a couple of hundred dollars. Really very cheap. Now, this is the absorbance spectrum of the carbon dots. And the reason I'm showing you this is because of this area here. You can see this is the visible spectrum of the sun between around the... Actually, this is the visible spectrum, not on the sun. The sun has also UV emission. But this is the visible spectrum from 400 to around 6700. When you see this peak here, this means that the carbon dots that can absorb light in the visible region, just like our eyes and our bodies. This is an a electron microscopy image of this uh, composite, this hydrogel. You see, there's a lot of empty space. There's this network of, of a polymer. This is plus the carbon dots. So it's, very, it's impossible to see the carbon dots here because the scale is micrometer. But they're here. The important thing about this image is to show you that carbon dots don't break the porous structure which is very important for water absorbance. But the color here, this is white, this is black. So the black color indicates that you have lots of carbon dots there. Now remember, there's no color here, no blue, no red, no green, but we don't care. We don't care about colors here. We only want the carbon dots to absorb the light. And these are the results. The results here are actually quite remarkable. These are photothermal images. These were taken with a camera that is sensitive to IR. These, you know, you can see that in spy movies, that these IR cameras that look for people in the dark. So basically, the color that you see indicative of the temperature. Okay, so this is the bear gel. Bear gel absorbs water, and then you irradiate it with the sun. 0 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. So obviously the temperature goes up a little bit from 21 degrees to 28 degrees. Okay? If you put yourself in the sun for 60 minutes, you feel hot. But look with the carbon dots. The carbon dots inside the gel. You start with 22 degrees at, at 0 minutes, but immediately, in, if even after 15 minutes you go to 43 degrees, 60 minutes you're already at 58 degrees. So just this just tells you that in a very short time you get to a very high temperature which is going to evaporate the water. Okay? These are the graphs, basically these pictures in a graphic form. Again, again you see the bear gel, very minor, the increase in temperature. And with the carbon dots, these are different concentrations of the carbon dots, so the trend is very clear. You see that in a, with a 5 milligram per mil you go 15 degrees, uh, increase temperature. With 20 mg, you go 35 degrees, increase the temperature in 60 minutes. And these are the results, the practical results of this system. This is removal of metal ions. Okay? So basically, if you evaporate water, the metal ions are going to stay behind. You get literally 100% removal of the of the metal just by doing this evaporation with the gel. Here you, uh, we tested uh, surfactants. You know, surfactants, you can find them in sewage. These are soaps and other things. You want to remove them. So here we me measure the surface tension. So this is a uh, water plus SDS. It's a very common surfactant. So you see that in a, a this, if the surface tension is very low, it means that you have SDS there. The surface tension becomes much higher after treatment with a carbon dot hydrogel. This is a, another organic dye called a rhodamine 6G. Very common organic dye for catalysis. Again, you see that initially 
you start with very high absorbance, high dye concentration. And then after treatment with the hydrocarbon dots, nothing. Okay, so these are just few examples of things that you actually can do with the system. You can purify water. Okay, to conclude, so uh, carbon dots are, uh, I hope I showed you, they are very versatile and uh, nanoparticles, having diverse applications. Really a very important properties of carbon dot that we used a lot, we call it a structural memory of the carbon dot precursors, which we use for molecular recognition. They have unique physical properties that can be exploited for various applications, you can use the fluorescence, you can use the absorbance, you can use the surface properties. If you want to learn some more about this, I published this book uh, about two years ago, I think. And so since then, there's lots of new things happened. But still, I think this book is, is very good. I'm not getting any percentage, just by the way. They gave me a flat rate, so if you buy it, it's not going to help me. <laughs> you can buy other books of mine that can help me, but these are not about carbon dots. <laughs> <laughs> a few uh, words about my university, it's called Ben Gurion University of the Negev, it's a, a young university, relatively speaking, 50 years old, it's a, a nice campus, a very active student body, it's in the desert, relatively, a, a, it's not so much desert anymore because of the, a, all the plants, but you can see these, these trees, like desert trees. You're welcome to visit. It's, it's, it's a nice place. Uh, these are my groups. Uh, this, oop, sorry. These are my, my group. These are not everybody was involved in the carbon dot. These are some of them. And we have some nice collaboration with, with various people. And thank you very much.